Good morning. Welcome to our worship for this third Sunday in Advent. Today we are going to be taking a look at our second lesson for today, which comes from the epistle of James, the fifth chapter, verses 7 through 11. And James here is emphasizing to us the importance of patience. And patience is certainly something that all of us most likely, I don't want to talk for you, but um, for me personally, um, patience is something that you really have to work at continually, isn't it? And that is true in the, in the manner in which we conduct ourselves as God's people as we anticipate that day in which Christ will come again and relieve the tensions that cause us to be uh, impatient. So today, James is encouraging us to be patient as we wait for the Lord's coming. With those thoughts in mind, we bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have together as we gather today around the gospel in both word and sacrament. We pray that through these means you will strengthen us in our love for you and our love for one another so that our lives truly display um, patience as we anticipate your coming and the full reception of the gift you have given to us in your, uh, as a result of your first coming into this world. Bless our worship with your spirit as we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. We open our worship today with hymn number 324. We will sing, sing stanzas one through four. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all your sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our readings for today are the readings for the third Sunday in Advent. Our first lesson is the 35th chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. As we think of the uh, aspect of being patient for the Lord's return, our Old Testament lesson puts before us the wonderful things that await us when Christ does come again in all of his glory. The wilderness and the desert will be glad. The wasteland of Arabah will rejoice and blossom like a crocus. It will bloom lavishly, and there will be great joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. It will be excellent like Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make the shaky knees steady. Tell those who have a fearful heart, be strong. Do not be afraid. Look, your God will come with vengeance. With God's own retribution, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unplugged. The crippled will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. Waters will flow in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The burning sand will become a pool and the thirsty ground there will be springs of water. There will be grass, reeds, and rushes where the haunts of jackals once lay. A highway will be there, a road that will be called the Holy Way. The impure will not walk there. It will be reserved for those who walk in that Holy Way. Wicked fools will not wander onto it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious animal go upon it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. Then those ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with a joyful shout, and everlasting joy will crown their heads. Happiness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. The word of the Lord. Today's psalm is one Psalm 146a. This morning we join in reading it responsibly. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes. In human beings who cannot save. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob. Whose hope is in the Lord their God. He upholds the cause of the oppressed. And gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord reigns forever. Glory be to the Father, 
and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We now turn our attention to the words which will be the basis of our meditation for today, taken from James chapter 5, beginning with verse 7. Therefore, brothers, be patient until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the valuable harvest from the ground, patiently waiting for it until he receives the early and late rain. You be patient too. Strengthen your hearts because the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain about one another, brothers, so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge is standing at the doors. Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering with patient endurance. See, we consider those who endured to be blessed. You have heard of the patient endurance of Job and have seen what the Lord did in the end because the Lord is especially compassionate and merciful. The word of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you alleluia 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 please rise for a reading from the gospels today's gospel reading comes from matthew chapter 11 we begin reading at the second verse as John sends messengers to confirm whether or not Jesus is truly the Messiah, Jesus reveals to us that the blessings that we see in his first coming do not compare to the blessings that will be revealed in him when he comes again in all of his glory. While John was in prison, he heard about the things Christ was doing. He sent two of his disciples to ask him, Are you the coming one, or should we wait for someone else? Jesus answered them, Go, report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the gospel is preached to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not take offense at me. As these two were leaving, Jesus began to talk to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? No. Those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. So what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and he is much more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Amen, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not appeared anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of the Lord. You, you may be seated. We continue now our service with hymn 315.
We return to the second lesson for today from the epistle of James, chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. I will just read the first couple verses once again. Therefore, brothers, be patient until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the valuable harvest from the ground, patiently waiting for it until he receives the early and late rain. You be patient, too. Strengthen your hearts because the coming of the Lord is near. We bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today as we have this opportunity to learn from the Holy Spirit through the through James the importance of being patient in our waiting for your Son's return, we pray for your Spirit that this patience might become more a part of our lives and be demonstrated in all we do. Let our study today glorify you as we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. The confusing thing of life is this. The wicked seem to prosper while God's people seem to suffer. And it seems as if the wicked suffer no consequences for the wrongs that they do. Listen to how the psalmist describes it in Psalm 73. He said, For there are no struggles at their death. Their bodies are sturdy. They do not have the trouble common to people. They are not plagued along with the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They wear violence like clothing. Their eyes bulge out of their fat. The schemes of their hearts step over boundaries. They mock. They speak maliciously. From a high perch, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens. Their tongues strut around on earth. Therefore, God's people turn to them and they drink it all in. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? See, this is what the wicked are like. Secure forever, they increase in strength. The wicked prosper and the godly suffer. God's people have struggled with this reality as far as this existence is concerned for centuries. And so we say with the Christians at the end of the book of Revelation, come, Lord Jesus. Come, come and bring justice. Come and take me to my real home. Come and let me have that full redemption that you prepared for me in your first coming into this world, secured to me in your resurrection and your ascension into heaven. It's easy for us to become like small children at this time of the uh, calendar year. Two weeks away from Christmas. Young children see the decorations coming out. They see the presents begin to pile up under the Christmas tree. They know that some of those gifts are for them. And so from time to time, they may ask grandparents or parents, how many more days? How many more days until we can open our gifts? When are we going to do it? They're impatient. And so too we become impatient because we want to open our gift, the gift that has our personal name on it, that full redemption that Christ will give to us when He comes again in all of its glory. That gift that is wrapped up in the work that Christ did for us while He was here. We are burdened by the wicked world around us and the personal struggles that we face in our day-to-day -day lives. We become impatient. Our brother in the faith, James, urges us not to become impatient. What he urges us to do is to remain steady and steadfast as we patiently wait for Jesus to keep his promise to come again in all of his glory. This morning we want to consider these words of encouragement from James as we live in times that can easily bring us down and cause us enormous anxiety. 
Let us be encouraged by the Holy Spirit through James to wait patiently for the coming of Jesus. When it comes to oppression, it's been around since the fall into sin. In the words just before our text, James is rebuking those who are very wealthy. He says, you know how you became wealthy? You've taken advantage of those who have less. You haven't paid your laborers what they are worth. You have been oppressive. And he calls upon them to repent of their wickedness and sin. In light of those who take advantage of others, now James turns his attention to those who are being taken advantage of. He says, therefore, brothers, in other words, therefore, in light of what he has said to the rich, he says, brothers, be patient until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the valuable harvest from the ground, patiently waiting for it until it receives the early and late rain. Be patient. In order to illustrate that, he uses the example of the farmer. Now, here in this region of the world, the farmer would have planted his crop in fall. And after he plants his seed in the ground, he waits patiently for a couple of things. The first thing is he needs that first rain after it gets in the ground so that it will be enabled to germinate and start to grow. And then as the months go by, there's nothing he can do. He simply patiently waits for that crop to increase and to develop. And now he's patiently waiting for another rain, a rain that comes in the early spring. And that is the rain that is now going to fill out the plant, fill out the grain so that he will have a good crop. There's nothing he can do about it. He's got to sit there and wait patiently. He needs to make sure that he doesn't go in the field and harvest it too soon. He has to do it at just the right time. James says the same thing is true for us as God's people. And you know, when you think about us as God's people, we are very much like farmers. God has entrusted to us the seed of his word, hasn't he? And that seed's not going to get planted unless you and I take that message of the gospel and share it with other people. We need to guard our hearts and minds from falling into the wicked and deceitful thinking of the world, which in our current situation is mushrooming every day as we speak. We are to live the truth of God's word in the midst of this corruption so that we can demonstrate to the world that Christ is the king of our hearts, that Christ has taken control of us through the gospel. And now we prepare ourselves to be able to do what? To share what it is that we believe in with those who ask us, why is it that you do what you do? How can you live in such a way in the midst of everything that is going on around you? We need to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's nothing that we can do as we share that word, as we plant that seed, as we distribute the wonderful message of the gospel. I don't have the least amount of power, nor do you, to cause that seed to take root in the heart of that person and to grow. We can't force it on others. We turn that all over to whom? We turn that all over to the Holy Spirit to work that out. And in the meantime... As we do the work that the Lord has given to us, we patiently wait for the time when Jesus is going to come in all of his glory and he will carry out the job of a farmer. He will cut down the plants. He will separate the grain from the chaff. The grain he will gather to himself, namely the believers, and the chaff, the unbelievers, he will throw that into the unquenchable fires of hell. We learn our patience from Jesus himself. Maybe you've asked this question. I know people have. And that is this. Why hasn't Jesus come yet? Doesn't he have enough people for his kingdom? Doesn't he see how bad and wicked things are? How there is such a threat out there to us, his people? 
Well, Paul told Timothy, he said, this is good and, and pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. An important characteristic of our God that many people overlook in our day and age is the fact that God is holy and just. And because he is a holy and just God, those who have rejected the forgiveness he offers in Christ, who still stand before him condemned because of their sins, he must tell them, depart from me into the unquenchable fires of hell. But he doesn't take pleasure in it. His will is what? His will is that people hear the gospel, repent, and believe in his son whom he sent into this world to rescue us. You see, this Christmas, when we look into the manger and we see that little baby there, you know what you see there? You see the heart of your gracious God. You see the fact that God did not withhold His Son from you, as Paul says in Romans 8, but was willing to give Him up for us all so that we might have eternal life. There's the heart of our gracious God. Each day that this world continues to exist, God demonstrates such a love for fallen mankind. Each day is living proof of His remarkable love. Peter wrote, the Lord is not slow to do what he promised. In other words, he's talking about Jesus coming again in all of his glory. As some consider slowness, instead he is patient for your sakes, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. Every day is an example, an illustration, evidence of God's love and patience for the sinner. Every day is an opportunity for us as Christians to explain to the world the true message that Christmas brings. Every day God is extending his hand to those who are impenitent to come to him. Come to him as they are weary in their sins to find the only true rest which is found in the work of Jesus. Every day as the Lord waits patiently on this sinful world... He gives to us the perfect example to follow. And so James says to us, you be patient too. Strengthen your hearts because the coming of the Lord is near. You know, to be patient in the midst of this wicked and evil world can only be obtained by strengthening our hearts in the love of Christ. The idea here behind the word to strengthen means to set something up in such a way that it's immovable. It's planted. No matter what you do to it, you cannot topple, you cannot move it from one place to the next. Thus, a way to translate this would be to say firmly established. The term was used of Jesus. When Jesus now determined to go to the cross, when he made that final trip to Jerusalem, in Luke's gospel, Luke wrote, when the days were approaching for him to be taken up, Jesus was determined, that's the same word in our text, from our text, determined to go to Jerusalem. What does that mean? Jesus was firmly entrenched in his resolve that nothing in all this world was going to keep him from going to the horrors of Calvary to save us from our sins. And what was the root of Jesus' resolve? Was it not love? Was it not love, first of all, for the Father? Was it not also love for you and for me? The blessed thing is, is that you and I now possess that love. John, in his first epistle, said we love because he first loved us. We were not born with that kind of love. We were born with a very selfish love, a love that only thought about ourselves, a love that took advantage of others, a love that was not willing to do for others unless we got something out of it. This love now is a part of our lives, agape love, a love that does because it is more concerned about others than it is about itself. God's love has replaced that selfish love that we were born with. And this love produces in us what? The perseverance to, the patience to persevere in the midst of unfairness, in the midst of all the wickedness and the evilness that we see in the world. 
Paul wrote about this love, you know, in the great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Look at how he defines it. And look at what the first word is he uses to describe this love. He says, love is what? Patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not brag. It is not arrogant. Love is first and foremost patient. In other words, we are slow to become angry. When someone says something harsh to us, we don't quickly use our sharp tongue to speak in the same way back to them. We wait patiently and know that vengeance, justice will come when Christ comes again in all of his glory. And it is on that day that those who persist in their rejection of Christ will receive what they deserve. It's not just the attacks of the world, though, is it? Against our Christian faith, against our Christian principles that wear us down and cause us to become impatient. It's also just the struggles of living in this sinful world that can cause us to become very irritable and impatient. James goes on to say, do not complain about one another, brothers, so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge is standing at the doors. Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering with patient endurance. See, we consider those who endured to be blessed. You have heard the patient endurance of Job and have seen what the Lord did in the end because the Lord is especially compassionate and merciful. Have you ever noticed when you're weighed down with the struggles of this life that it's easy for you to take it out on the people around you? James warns us not to let that happen in our lives, especially when we talk about the body of Christ. The word here, complain, has as its root meaning to groan. The weight of sin has, was, has been brought into this world by Adam and Eve's fall into sin. And that weight of sin seems overwhelming at times. Paul uses the same term in Romans to describe how all creation is struggling. He says, for we know that all creation is groaning with the birth pains right up to the present time. And not only creation, but also we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we eagerly await our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. You see, this is something that's deep down inside of us, something that we really struggle with. We are weighed down. We are burdened. We are groaning. We are waiting for Christ to come again. But James is warning us, do not let that struggle lead you now to groan against each other, to complain against each other, to react in an unreasonable way with a brother or sister in Christ. What does he say we are doing if we grumble against one another? He says to give way to such feelings is going to invite judgment from whom? Invite judgment from the Lord. He warns us, he says, he's standing right outside the door, ready to turn the doorknob and open it up. And we don't know when that is going to be. As Scripture says, He's going to come like a thief in the night. And so every day we need to be prepared and we need to be guarding our hearts and our minds and our tongues that we aren't taking it out on one another in the process of all of this. What if He opens the doors and suddenly steps in unexpectedly and He finds us conducting ourselves in an impatient way, groaning in dissatisfaction with one another like the world does? To give us encouragement and examples to follow in our lives, he first of all points to the example of the prophets of the past. The prophets of the past did not have an easy life. They found themselves persecuted by their own people and hunted down. Jesus said this to the people in Jerusalem shortly before his death. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. They rejected the prophets. They killed the true prophets. Stephen, right before he was executed by these same people, said, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who prophesied the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. 
The word prophet means mouthpiece. They were handpicked, anointed by God to do what? To speak for the Lord. They weren't speaking for themselves. They were speaking the words the Lord gave to them and the people rejected them. And yet they did not become discouraged. But they continued on and, and persevered in patience, awaiting the day when they would be taken out of this world into God's eternal kingdom. He gives us the example of Job as well. He says, look at Job. Look at what Job endured patiently. And he said, how did it all turn out in the end? The Lord blessed him. He's saying to us that in the midst of all of this, we can be happy. We can be happy if we find our happiness in the blessed message of Christmas and Easter. In a few moments, we will join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. And in that second petition, we will pray, Your kingdom come. Do you know what you're praying for when you ask the Lord that His kingdom come? As Luther points out, the kingdom of God's already in our hearts if we're believers. Christ has taken control of our lives. He has come into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit through the gospel message. So as God's people, when we pray, Your kingdom come, one of the things we're praying in that petition is that that rule of Jesus will be strengthened in our life. That we will become stronger in our faith in Christ. Our love for Him will increase. Our love for one another will increase. As we studied this this past Thursday in our youth confirmation class, we closed our study with this question. What role do regular worship, the study of God's Word, the Lord's Supper, and baptism play in God's kingdom coming to us? Our regular worship, our participation in Bible study here in our congregation, our regular partaking of the Lord's Supper, and our daily remembrance of the blessings and the meaning of baptism are God's, the Holy Spirit's tools to more firmly establish us in Christ and empower us and enable us to endure patiently through the struggles of this life as we anticipation opening the greatest gift we will ever receive when we are taken out of this world. Life isn't fair. And we need to get used to that and we need to accept it. But there will come a time when things will be set straight. And that will be when Jesus comes in all of his glory. A day not known to us. A day that will be the perfect day, just as the first coming of Christ took place on the perfect day in the history of the world as well. But let us live each day in the anticipation that his coming is truly near. Let us help one another in our walk here in this world of struggles to wait patiently for the coming of the Lord Jesus so that we do not grumble against each other but work collectively together under the power of the Holy Spirit to share the message of the gospel with others so that as you pray that petition, you will also be praying that that kingdom will enter into the hearts of others so that they will be able to stand in the judgment with us and enjoy God's wonderful kingdom for all eternity. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please join with me now in making confession of your Christian faith. Today we use the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, 
He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please remain standing. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we draw near to once again having the privilege to celebrate the sending of your Son into this world the first time, help us to see how it required great patience on the part of your people of the Old Testament. For that promise took thousands of years to be fulfilled. But as with any promise that you make, we know that your promises are always good. And we know that your timing is perfect. And so when the time was just right, you sent Jesus. As we take a look at that wonderful gift in Bethlehem again this year, make us mindful of all the blessings that we have, gifts that this world cannot give to us, gifts that are eternal, gifts that are comforting, gifts that give us security in this world. Help us to avoid the impatience that so easily can enter into our hearts as we struggle with the persecution of the world and struggle with the day-to-day -day, uh, effects of sin in this world. Help us to always look to the patient endurance of your Son, who endured the pain of the cross on our behalf, so that in the end we would not have to endure suffering, but only experience joy and peace in your kingdom for eternity. Use us to share this message of peace and patience with others that they might find the true source of eternal life. Help us not to become discouraged, but help us to see our responsibility to one another to help each other in this journey here in this life until we are with you in eternity. We ask these things in the name of our Savior, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated for the dis distribution of the Lord's Supper.
Please rise. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give you thanks to the Lord for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We close with the fifth stanza of our opening hymn, hymn 324. Mm -hmm. 